All right, everybody. I got uh, 803, 804, so we're going to go ahead and get this show on the road so we can get y'all to the next uh, breakout session on time. Uh, myself and Dr. Snyder are going to talk a little bit about cotton agronomics and physiology. Um, I think we got some good information for you guys, and hopefully it'll help y'all out on the farm, okay? Um, you know, this time a year ago, if you come and hear me talk, I just started off with a funny story about Dr. Philip Roberts shooting a crow and eating it. It didn't taste very good. Um, I had a two-month-old back in November, my wife did, and so it's been kind of hard to come up with a funny story this time, so we're just going to get right into it, okay? So the, these are the locations for our 2022 variety trial program, all right? Of course, the beauty of this program is that it's a wide range of uh, yield environments, geographical locations throughout the state, uh, as far southwest as Seminole County, which of course is as far southwest you can go. And then up to Burke County, those are on the Midhill uh, Station there in Burke County. And then we've got one in Oconee County as well. We've got some uh, cotton growers up there. We like to have a little information for them as well. Again, a very diverse set of uh, yield environments and geographical locations throughout the state. So I think if you are a grower or a consultant in this room, there's definitely something that applies to you, all right? The varieties included are there on the left side of the screen, all right? Start off, of course, with 1646, which still in many parts of the state is still the most planted variety, but a couple new ones I want to point out to the program are Delpine 2127, Stone Bull 4595, Next Gen 4190 is new to the variety trial, and so is Armor 9371. Okay, everybody gets the gist with the variety trial, right? It's planted in grower fields, replicated in large plots, Managed using their equipment, their practices uh, with the participating county agent, right, with their assistance. We also, at the end of the season, once it's harvested, we pull a seed cotton sample, gin those at the microgen, and uh, that'll help us get a more realistic turnout than a tabletop gin, and also some more realistic fiber quality days. Okay? So, uh, these are the results of the 2022 program. All right, on the far left, you got the variety. Next to that is the length yield statistics, and then the percent of times that those varieties yielded above the location average. All right, so uh, looking at the statistics real quick, if it's got the same letter next to it, that means it's a similarly yielding variety. All right, so for example, Delpine 2038 has a B next to it, and so does Next Gen 3195. So I would say nine times out of ten, those varieties are going to yield the same. Okay, that's pretty much what this is saying here. And then with the percent above trial average, pretty much what that is, is just a measure of variety stability. Okay, so we've got 22 locations, as I mentioned, um, you know, wide range of yield environments for sure. But we want to look at varieties that are extremely stable across those yield environments. Okay, and so this helps us do that, and I'll kind of explain how I calculate all that in a second. So pretty much how I interpret this table here is that uh, I would go from left to right. The highest yielding variety in 22 was Dynagro 3799 at 1,314 pounds of land per acre. It's got an A next to it, meaning it's the highest yielding variety, and it yields above average 86% of the time. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody, kind of how to walk through that table? <clears throat> so a couple things to point out. From top to bottom, you've got 181 pounds of difference. All right, in all these varieties. Whenever I send an email out to the companies and ask for their entries, I tell them to send me the best they got, and they do. All right, 181 pounds is not a lot. Of course, I know it makes a big difference on the farm, but we've seen bigger differences for sure. Okay, so at the end of the day, you got to choose a variety and place it where it's going to be successful. Okay, and you guys know your fields better than anybody and know what you desire for your operation, right? Um, one thing for sure to think about is how to manage these varieties, okay? <clears throat> Particularly as it comes to pigs, okay? Uh, if anybody anybody in this room planted some Dynagro 3799? Yeah, a handful. All right. Has anybody lost control of it? It gets away from you pretty quick, huh? So yeah, that's an extremely aggressive variety, all right? It may not be the best one to be planting an hour away from the house or your base, wherever you are. Okay, because it's going to require some really timely management to keep it under control. So there's some other varieties here 
that are a little more responsive to pigs that are going to be a good fit and still have really good yield potential. Um, really, any of them are a little more responsive than that $37.99. Of course, you got other things, full season, short season, you name it. Technology package, of course, most of them are extend flex, but you got some enlist varieties here. And then also, you know, one thing to consider, and Bob would punch me in the face if I didn't mention it, right, is the nematode resistance packages in some of these varieties. He, he's real big on some of that. So um, fiber quality is another thing to keep in mind. Of course, 1646 is pretty much the gold standard right now in terms of fiber quality, good, good fiber quality. And then uh, there's some other ones in this set, <coughs> all right? So this is the big table that is available for everybody. It's on the UGA Cotton Team website, which is ugacotton.com, okay? You can go access that anytime. If you're having trouble sleeping at night, you can pull it up and it'll probably put you to sleep, okay? Uh, but I try to put a lot of colors on it so that it's fairly easy to read. Um, the yellow locations are our dry land locations. The blue are irrigated, all right? And then across the bottom, you see the location average for each of these trials. And so whenever you look at uh, within a location and it's highlighted green, that means that that variety yielded above average in that location. And so whenever I calculate that percent above trial average, all I do is go across and count the green boxes and divide it by the total number of trials and that converts it to a percent. And again, that's an indicator of variety stability over a wide range of environments, okay? Any quick questions about this? Yes, not this, but the previous slide. Why are you going on 10% and not 5%? That's a good question. So I, that would really fractionate them. Yeah, that's possibly. true. That's true. Yeah, it, that's a great question. I, I kind of model myself after Eric Crosco, and he uses 10%. Really, you know, it's kind of a 90% likelihood, right? And that's kind of what I base it on. And he, he does the same for weed control, really, because it's like, hey, if you can get 90% weed control, then that's pretty good. Okay. Does that answer your question? All right. Um, one last thing on this. Uh, there's a red line separating Miller and Mitchell County. That's the overall trial average, which was 1,226 pounds per acre. I think that's less than 100 pounds more than it was a year ago. But we separate that because growers know uh, at the end of the day which fields are going to be below average and which ones are going to be above average, and that might be a better way to look at this data set. So these are our below average yielding locations. And again, I know that everybody has fields like this that you would anticipate are gonna be uh, below average, but kind of the trend here is that there's a little bit less separation within the varieties in the low average locations. You've got a group of seven varieties here, I believe it is, if I can count right, that are yielding the same in below average environments, okay? So any of those are really good varieties, and of course they're extremely stable. Most of them are yielding above the trial average 50% of the time or more, okay? Again, great varieties and for a multitude of situations, all right? And then you've got your above average locations, all right? And so it kind of goes back to the trend of the big table where Dynabro 37.99 is at the top and kind of step above everybody else, but then you've still got pretty much the same order just below that, okay? As I mentioned, you know, keep in mind that whenever you're placing a variety, you got to be able to be timely with managing that variety. And so that, that $37.99 may not be for everybody, but it still is a, a good cotton variety. Last thing on the on-farm variety trial, okay, this is the two-year data, which has averaged over 47 locations, all right? We want to look at variety data across a multitude of environments, across uh, multiple locations, and so this is what we're doing here. This is eight varieties, okay? And the only reason it's eight is because there was only eight common varieties between the last two years, all right? Same story, different day, 37.99 at the top, and yielding above average 85% of the time, but pretty much from Armour 98.31 and up, you've got varieties that are yielding above average 50% of the time or more. Okay, so again, we've got a laundry list of varieties that do really well in Georgia. All of them make cotton, but I, I'll just uh, reiterate that you guys know your fields better than anybody, and putting a variety where it's going to be successful is key to your success as a grower, okay? One last thing on varieties, okay, and this isn't the on farm trial or anything. Um, I'm sure that most of y'all in this room have heard of a new technology called Thrival, okay? 
Um, I've been looking at it the last two years with a large set of varieties. Um, of course, I can't put them on the best ground in the world because it's still a stewarded technology, and so we got to kind of tuck it back next to the woods and some of our worst dirt. But at the end of the day, we still get to show the genetic capabilities of these varieties compared to each other. All right. I just want to spend a second talking about this because there's four of the uh, Bogart Extend Flex varieties that I looked at this year. Um, three of them were in the home farm variety trial, and then one of the new ones is 2333 from Delpine. Um, they're pretty high on that variety. If you hadn't heard about it yet, you will. Um, and then the Thrive On varieties, which is B3TXF, the T stands for Thrive On in there. Those are the new technology, all right? 2131 and 2211 have been around for a while, um, but the 2317 and 2328 are new releases uh, from Delpine, okay? And they're not the only company that's gonna have this technology in a bag of seed, but um, it's just one of the companies that I've been able to work with and have named varieties. Because really, what I wanna show here is that the eight varieties listed, there wasn't any difference in yield, okay? So what I did was I grouped it by technology, all right? And there wasn't any statistical difference in yield between Thrive On and non Thrive On varieties, but the non thrive on do kind of tend to rise to the top, okay? Why am I saying that, okay? Brandon, the thrive on technology ain't gonna be free, is it? It's not gonna be free, all right? You're gonna have to pay for it, and so at the end of the day, you wanna put those varieties where they're gonna be successful whenever they are available for commercial uh, release, okay? It may not happen this year, but it may happen next year. I just want you guys to be able to make an informed decision on where to put these varieties because this is a trait that targets thrips and plant bugs, okay? Anybody in here from East Georgia? A couple guys? Y'all ever spray plant bugs? One, a couple times maybe? A couple times? Okay, so um, that might be a fit for it, but really for most of the growers across the state, it's really good on thrips, okay? And that's where it's gonna have the best fit for us in Georgia. Now, nine times out of 10, where you gonna have your heaviest thrips pressure? on your earliest plant of cotton, right? In about April, okay? Those are the situations where I would consider using a Thrive On variety, and again, I kind of keep coming back to, um, you know, there's some situations where you farm really far away from where you're based out of, okay? And that might be a situation where these varieties might be successful because you can't circle back and make a timely thrift spray on every field, right? So. Those are the type of things to consider, but at the end of the day, I do show this to say, hey, look, the yield potential of the varieties is the same, okay? A thrive on, non thrive on. So keep that in mind if you're making decisions, because two, it's not gonna be free, and you wanna put it where it's gonna be successful, all right? Did you spray those plots for plant bugs and thrips? Uh, we did spray for thrips, scouted for plant bugs, and we didn't have any, so it wasn't necessary. Yep. Any other questions on that? Okay, so what, what's, the, what's the big difference we're staring at? You know, we're staring down the barrel of, of a different kind of year this time, and of course the big difference is uh, cotton price, right? Um, the cash price for cotton was $1.50 almost a year ago, and of course I was uh, corrected by one of my Jenner friends the other night that many of us don't see the cash price for cotton. We, we book on a contract, right? And so the contract price was hovering right around $1.30 almost a year ago this time, okay? But now, lately, if you keep track of the cotton price, it's hovering between 80 and 90 cents, okay? But what's the problem with inputs? Still high, right? So we, we got quite a situation on our hands that we're, we're coming into this year. Um, I want you guys to get the most bang for your buck, okay, at the end of the day. I want you guys to have the best return on investment that you can. Um, and we have a little less room for error. I go on a lot of troubleshooting calls every year, and nine times out of 10, some of those things are preventable, okay? So we just need to be extra careful this year. And as I mentioned, I want you guys to be successful and have the biggest bang for your buck and get the most return on your investment. And that kind of brings me into the next topic, which is largely based on uh, return on investment and some of this wide row and skip row cotton, okay? <clears throat> So uh, at the end of the day, I talked about this a year ago, but the main goal of this system is to save on seed, right? And seed's one of the biggest inputs that you got, okay? One of the biggest decisions a grower makes every year, okay? But 
We've been doing research on this the last two years. I'll briefly talk about the wide row stuff that I talked about last year because we added a second year of data. Um, we got our standard 36 inch rows, 48 60s, which is kind of where this started out in the mid south, and then 72s, which would be a better fit for Georgia growers if wide row um, was the way to go because you would just skip every other planter box on the 36 inch row planter. All right, just kind of a proof of concept slide here showing that we planted the seed, three seed per foot, and you get different plant populations as you go to wider row spaces, okay? So the highest plant populations in our 36, you reduce it with 48 inches, but then in 60s and 72s, you get the lowest plant population of 37 to 46% reduction, okay? Again, proof of concept there. Now, you know, this is the end of the season. I took these pictures right before we ran a picker through, and the 36 inch rows are there on the left. 72s are on the right, okay? The 72s look pretty good, right? You see a lot of pictures like that at the end of the year um, on Facebook or what have you, but at the end of the day, Adrian, we, we get paid on pounds, isn't that right? That's what I heard. So um, at the end of the day, it just doesn't add up, okay? Our highest yielding treatment was our 36 inch rows, um, and then the 72 inches was the only one that significantly reduced our cotton yield, 15%. Okay, now if you do some quick math, that's about what, 150, 200 pounds, right? If you save about $50 on seed, does that math work out? No, sir, it does not, okay? Now the interesting thing is that the 48s and 60s are fairly similar, all right? Now, there's a lot of growers in here that are cotton and peanut farmers and they're not gonna go buy a new set of equipment to farm on 48 and 60 inches or 30 inches, right? So that's kind of the deal with that. But for some of our more serious corn guys, the 60 stuff might work, okay? Um, that's something to kind of think about in the future. But, you know, like I said, similar to 36s, but not feasible for most of our growers in the state. And then the 72s, which is the most feasible option, uh, you see a 15% reduction in the yield, okay? Now, there's a lot of growers in here from different parts of the state. And uh, if I asked you about a year ago, you know, at the end of August, early September, what were most people looking at in the field? A little bit of bowl rot, right? And that's, that's a big deal with this type wide row system, okay? People, people think that the wide row is gonna open up that canopy, increase airflow, and it's probably gonna help with bowl rot, right? And so what we did at the end of the year was we went in and we counted rod and hard lock bowls on these plants and then counted uh, the rest of the bowls and we can convert that to a percentage, okay? So over here we got the percent of rod and hard lock bowls by our row space, okay? Statistically no difference, okay? But you do see a 5% reduction from 36 to 72 inch rows, all right? That's all good and great. It makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside, doesn't it, to reduce bowl rot, but at the end of the day, you get paid on pounds, okay? you lose almost 250 pounds of lint whenever you reduce bowl rot, okay? So, at the end of the day, with this type study, what I saw was a little more bowl rot, but a little more cotton, and I'd sign up for that deal, okay? But, one thing that came up at the end of every meeting last year was, number one, did you include a two-in-one skip? And I said no, because a lot of that work was done in the 90s, okay? And I thought we had kind of passed that, but apparently not. And then the second question was, what about newer varieties, okay? Um, the variety used in the previous study was 1646, and we've got a lot uh, more high-powered varieties that we can uh, look at for this type of system. So what we did was we initiated a new study this year looking at standard row spacings, a two-in-one skip, and our 72-inch wide row system, all right? We did two locations, all right? And I, I want to iterate that this was done on purpose. Our tipping location was dry land just across the road here. And I wanted to stress this cotton out, okay? Wanted to see how it would do in a stressful situation, a low yield environment, okay? Because I kind of had a hunch about something we'll get there in a second. But then the midville location, if anybody over here is from East Georgia, you know that Anthony don't make bad cotton, right? He, he makes pretty good cotton. And so, I wanted to do it in midfield as well and really kind of push those top end yields and see how these systems did there as well. The varieties included are there on the right side of the slide, Stone 591, 5 400, Dime 3799, and Delphine 1840. Some of my seed company friends told me that those might be the best fit for these type systems, okay? So uh, this is again a proof concept slide just showing 
that you have the highest plant population in your normal row space and you reduce it a little bit in your two and one skip and then on your wide road you try to cut it in half, right? And that's the goal of the system is to save on seed, all right? But you've got to maintain lint yields, okay? So these are our lint yields, all right? Red bars are Tifton, black bars are Midville, all right? Interestingly, interestingly, okay, in Tifton, all right, which I said is a low yield environment and did that on purpose. I really wanted to stress this cotton out. The highest yield in treatment was our normal row spacing treatment, okay? But when you look at our wide row, it ain't but 40 pounds off, which I think is kind of interesting, okay? This cotton was planted April 20th and pretty much sat until June 20th before it got a rain, okay? And I don't know if that's playing into it or not, but I did see that a lot of the standard row spacing cotton was kind of drooped over and thirsty about midday whenever the wide row cotton was still perked up and going, okay? That, it's just kind of an interesting observation but, you know, looking at that, and then, of course, you see our high-yield environment where in midfield our normal row spacing made about 200 pounds better than our 2-in-1 uh, skip and wide row, okay? So after this one year, you can't really draw a ton of conclusions, but, you know, just kind of thinking about it and then looking to next year, which we'll repeat the study, the wide row might be a better fit in our lower-yield environments, okay? But now some, some of you guys have low yielding fields, right, and kind of know what to expect off of those. Every now and then you kind of hit it, right, and you'll make cotton on that ground, okay? And that's what scares me a little bit about selling out on the wide row stuff, okay? You don't want to go whole hog into it, and then what if water's your limiting resource and it's a dry land field and it hits just right and you can make some of these higher yields, okay? That's what scares me a little bit about it. And so I wouldn't go all out just yet. but we did also look at bull rot in these studies too, all right? We went back and counted them, converted it to a percent, okay? Again, our tenth location was planted April 20th, so we timed it just right where those bowls were opening as it started raining, as it was overcast every day, and we got a lot of bull rot in there, okay? We had higher bull rot than we did in Midville, and I think anybody who's traveled the state and looked at cotton around knows that in the southwest part of the state, we're probably going to get ball rot a little worse than uh, some of our friends over in East Jordan, okay? But what's interesting is you see a little bit of a numerical reduction there in ball rot, but at the end of the day, it wasn't significant, okay? So pretty much in Tifton, where it was bad, it was just bad, okay? And there's nothing you can do about it, all right? But then in Midville, we did see a reduction where it wasn't as bad. Okay, where bowl rot was not as bad, our skip and wide row systems reduced bowl rot. Okay, but what we just get done talking about? In Midville, it was a high yield environment and we lost on lint. Okay, so at the end of the day, the bowl rot was more severe in Tifton and row rank, but did not statistically reduce it. And where the bowl rot was not as bad, which was in Midville, the alternative row arrangements reduced bowl rot, but also reduced lint yield. Okay, so. Um, just kind of with that and the other wide row study, I'd take a little more bowl rod with a little more lint, okay? That's pretty much all I got today. Um, I, we can talk about whatever else after this, and Dr. John Snyder's got a good talk for us too, but of course, want to thank the commission for everything that they do. That's a grower-funded organization, right? And so um, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without you guys, okay? Of course, our county agents, grower cooperators, and their partners as well. Um, are there any quick questions for me before I hand it over to Dr. Schneider? I'll be around all day. Pull me aside if y'all want to talk. Um, we can talk about all kinds of stuff. Physiologist here at the University of Georgia in Tifton. Um, and so, what I'd like to do today is just before I get started, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out and, uh, uh, you know, and of course, thank the university and the, and the cotton official for this opportunity to speak to you today. Um, but let me just go ahead and start off with, uh, with 
by talking about some factors that affect the growth and yield of cotton. Okay, and so I'm going to start off with nitrogen, uh, nitrogen availability. Okay, so let's go ahead and start more specifically with nitrogen deficiency. So when we talk about nitrogen deficiency from a from a physiological perspective, what are the underlying processes that are affected that drive your yield loss when you're under nitrogen deficient conditions? And so what we know is that under nitrogen deficiency, we have reductions in growth, right? Everyone knows that. That's one of the primary things that happens is we have a smaller canopy. And when we have a smaller canopy, there's less leaf area available to intercept incoming light. Okay? Now that leaf area also is less photosynthetically efficient. So of the light that it actually captures, that your canopy captures, it's using that light less efficiently. So total, that canopy is producing less carbohydrates to support a certain number of bowls per unit land area. Okay, so you have reductions in both fruiting sites and the ability of that canopy to support bowls anyway. So you'll have lower, you may have lower fruit retention, but you will definitely have fewer bowls per unit land area, and of course that causes yield reductions. Now at the other end of the spectrum, we've got nitrogen excess, right? If we have too much nitrogen, we could produce rank growth. We could see uh, reductions in fruit retention, particularly at lower nodes on the plant. So if you have a lot of uh, vegetative growth, that usually that can occur at the expense of reproductive growth. So the plant may set less fruit low on the plant, but then start to set it as a little bit later in the season. And of course, if that happens, it also has the effect of delaying maturity, right? So these are kind of the opposite ends of the spectrum there. Now, what about water availability? So I've, I got this picture that I've presented at probably every talk. I need a little clearer version of this picture, there's no question. But I think, you know, we were doing some drought stress research in my lab in 2014. And, and so down in Camilla, we've got these variable rate systems. And so we transition from, from a well water treatment here to a drought stress treatment. And I think, well, let me back up here. Uh, and I think what you can see here really tells everything you need to know about drought stress. You have reductions in canopy growth, similar to what we talked about with nitrogen deficiency. You can see those row middles still haven't closed. Um, you can't tell it probably as much, but those leaves are actually severely wilted. So the light that that canopy does capture, it's, it's using it less efficiently. Uh, the other thing that's very noticeable here is because you have a smaller canopy, you have fewer fruiting sites, there's less vegetative growth, you get less yield potential, and the crop, what is it doing right there? <clears throat> What's it doing? What else do you see? Huh? You see blooms, right? You see blooms at the top of the plant, right? So that crop is also cutting out really early compared to this well water treatment. So ultimately, we see those yield reductions, okay? Now, as we move forward, well, if we have excess water, and of course, if you've got excess water in combination with high nitrogen, you know, you'll see things like this. You'll see excess vegetative growth if we don't keep it controlled. Um, that's, that's my student Josh Lee in that cotton right there. He's not a particularly tall individual, but still, it's got him pretty well covered up, all right? Um, but again, some of the, you know, if you don't keep the, if you're not managing water appropriately, you'll see this excess vegetative growth. And again, we know that that kind of depends also on how we manage growth chemically, right? So. Uh, we know that methoquat chloride decreases internode elongation and it controls vegetative growth. So everybody knows that it shortens those internodes, right? Uh, that we have, we have less internode growth, but also the leaves of those plants are typically a little bit smaller and they're actually a little thicker, have a little bit more chlorophyll per unit area. So when you apply picks, even without noticing height differences, what is one of the things that you see? Makes it green. Makes it green, right? Makes it green, and that's why. Okay? Um, all right. It's good to plant questions in the audience, okay? Um, but anyway, so the other thing that PICS does is since we can control that vegetative growth early on, there's more light penetration down into the canopy, the plant sets more fruit early. Early fruit set is one of the best controllers of growth that we have. And so what else happens is we see, we see earlier maturity as well. Okay? So look, I think everyone who works in cotton is pretty familiar with all of this. Now, why would I talk about all of these things that seem to be completely, I don't want to say they're unrelated, but they're, they're kind of different, different treatments, right? Different th factors that affect growth 
and yield. And the reason I want to talk about this is because we know that anything that affects growth and yield can affect both nutrient uptake and nutrient use efficiency. Okay? So a lot of our recommendations, our yield goal-based recommendations, a lot of this work was done throughout the Cotton Belt years and years ago. There's a lot more of it going on now. But really, what, what was done is that nutrient uptake by the cotton plant was characterized and related to lint yield. So at what nutrient uptake do we see optimal lint yield, or maximum lint yield, I should say, okay? And so those critical values for particular yield thresholds were developed. So we get a lot of questions, well, we've got much higher yield, uh, much higher yielding cultivars at this point, right? So does that alter our, our nitrogen management decisions and this type of thing? And so what I wanted to do is to develop a study where we alter growth and yield by manipulating those three factors we just talked about, water availability, nitrogen, and PGRs, and then define at what point, you know, at what point do we see that yield hit that maximum level. So long term, that is the goal here, okay? So I've got this slide. I'm not going to read from the slide. This is more something you present at Beltwide when you, almost like when you're a graduate student, and you have to have a hypothesis and objective on the slide. But to sum the whole thing up, uh, what we wanted to do was to evaluate uh, biomass, lint yield, nutrient uptake, and nutrient use efficiency uh, as a function of nitrogen, uh, water availability, and, uh, and uh, fix management. All right? So materials and methods. I'll tell you a little bit about the experiment that we conducted. We did this experiment. This is the first year of the experiment. We're going to repeat it again next year. Uh, where we did this work at uh, Stripling Irrigation Research Park in Camilla, Georgia. You notice that uh, on the previous slides, the variety that was the highest yield was $37.99. So I, I specifically picked that one for, to kind of start this trial off. Um, we had two different irrigation treatments, a well watered and a dry land treatment. And so well watered, we're using the uh, Smart Irrigation app for that. Uh, any of you interested in irrigation, obviously there's talks that, uh, that you can go to today to kind of see what's being done in that area. Um, but we had two irrigation treatments. We had three different PGR treatments. So uh, we had an untreated, a moderate, and an aggressive. I'm going to define these, and, and I know that if I start talking to people in this room, you're all going to have a different idea of what constitutes a moderate and aggressive strategy, all right? But I've got the untreated control, so this is if you do nothing related to PICS management. This is uh, the moderate treatment. We have a 12 ounce application at first flower, 16 ounces uh, two weeks later. And the only difference between that and the aggressive is that we have a pre bloom application, a 10 ounce application at the eight leaf stage, kind of at the start of square, okay? <clears throat> So if you have any questions about whether that's enough to really see growth differences, I kind of wanted to show you this as well. Um, so this is an untreated control. I'm messing up with this clicker. But anyway, this is the untreated control. And what you can see there, that white line is just a yardstick, okay? So in the untreated control, you can see that we've still got, you know, two to three feet of growth here. And it's not the most, this actually isn't the most aggressively growing part of the field, but it showed differences anyway that I could show here. Uh, this is our moderate. It's just a little bit taller than that yardstick. And then in the aggressive, this, the aggressive is a cutout here, okay? These were all done at the same time. And you can see that really only the end hills are, are a yard tall. Everything else is lower than that, okay? So we were able to generate the growth differences that we wanted. And then nitrogen treatments. So no nitrogen, the recommended rate. And I'm putting in here the kilograms per hectare rate. The only reason I'm doing that is some of the, the figures that you're going to see today, I wasn't at, since our I wasn't able to update them to pounds per acre, so you're going to see some of that as we move along. But you'll still see the treatment differences here. Um, but you can see we have a recommended rate of 120 pounds per acre. That's in a relatively sandy site down there in Camilla, 180 pounds per acre. So we've got again kind of a a zero a recommended and a high. All right. That nitrogen was applied as urea, so it applied 25%. Uh, at planting, 75% at squaring. Uh, and the design, just to kind of show you how this was laid out, we had three different pivots. Uh, it's their variable rate pivots. We were able to apply, had, had our irrigated treatment in one half of the field, dry land in the other half, and of course we randomized which was which. And then within each of those pivots, we had these strips of different nitrogen treatments. So you can see that here, ranging from you know, the zero, 120, and 180. Uh, and then within each one of those, 
we nested our PGR management treatments, okay? So our untreated, moderate, and aggressive treatment. So right before defoliation, we took plant samples from the field, we cut them out of the field, took them back to the lab, separated them into vegetative and reproductive parts, um, and dried them out in a, in a forced air dryer and then uh, sent the samples to waters for nutrient analysis. And so we were able to get our, there's actually a lot more data than this, I'm just gonna focus on nitrogen, but we were able to get our nitrogen concentration, our nit and from the biomass we were able to calculate nitrogen uptake, and then if we know that, and we know our lint yield, we can calculate nitrogen use efficiency. In other words, how much lint is produced per unit of nitrogen taken up by the plant. Okay? So, uh, lint yield and gin turnout, of course at the end of the season we harvested the center two rows of each plot, and uh, we got our gin turnout at the microgen. So let's go ahead and talk about some of our, our main, main treatments here. Okay? We thought we'd see all kinds of interactions between PGR and nitrogen and irrigation, and that wasn't necessarily the case. There's one that I'll talk about a little bit today. All right? But with nitrogen rate, um, I don't think this necessarily surprises anybody that when we go from zero nitrogen uh, to our recommended rate, keep in mind that's 120 pounds per acre there, that we see, this, we see, max, we see a significant jump in lint yield. Uh, we see really no change as we increase that to 180 pounds per acre, okay? So you can see the response to nitrogen. But what I think is kind of interesting here is that we also see this drop. As we increase nitrogen application rate, we see this significant drop in gen turnout, okay? At every step. So we're not necessarily affecting yield, right? Lint yield, but gen turnout just keeps dropping and keeps dropping, okay? Now, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind because I want to talk about that at the end of the, you know, of, of the slides today. Okay. Biomass. If we look at biomass, not surprising. Our our fertilized treatments had more biomass, but I want you to also notice um, that the big differences that we were seeing is reproductive biomass. We gave the plants more nitrogen; they produced more reproductive biomass. Okay. That's where a lot of our differences are coming in. And keep in mind that the sampling was done right before defoliation, so the plants would have had the maximum amount of dry weight into their, uh, you know, into reproductive development, okay? All right, so if we look at nitrogen uptake, not surprising here that we have higher uptake in our fertilized treatments, but because we've got higher lint yield and we've got higher uptake in those treatments, right? They kind of offset each other in terms of nitrogen use efficiency. And what's really nice here is that this nitrogen use efficiency kind of stays the same, whether we're at the zero end, whether, you know, as we increase our nitrogen application rate, the nitrogen use efficiency of the plant, I'm not talking about fertilizer use efficiency, but the efficiency of the plant stays the same, all right? In other words, we have a pretty solid value for, uh, okay, how much lint is produced per unit of nitrogen applied, okay? So, as we move forward, we look at irrigation, this is kind of an interesting one and not one that I necessarily expected this year. Uh, we always say as physiologists, if you're seeing wilting in your cotton, no, it's too late. I think that is true for certain times of the year. Okay, I have to amend my previous statements, okay? Um, so this year, and I mean it's numerically lower, but it's not significant. This year, we saw like in the early season, it was dry, right? And, and so we had pretty obvious wilting going on. I had a graduate student, you know, who presented at Beltwide and actually won an award on this and showed really obvious differences in photosynthetic rate and all that. But in the end, you know, we started catching rain and early flowering and on through the season, and the crop did pretty good. All right? So uh, no difference in lint yield, uh, no difference in gen turnout. If we look at, at biomass, the one thing we did affect was vegetative biomass. There was more vegetative biomass in irrigated plots there was higher nutrient uptake in irrigated plots, okay? So irrigated plots had more vegetative biomass, they took up more nitrogen, but because the yields weren't any better, right, than the dry land, the dry land actually had higher nitrogen use efficiency. Okay, so there's a practical take home message that I wanna to get to, again, at the end of the slide. So just, just keep this in the back of your mind as well, all right? Now growth management, all right, 
with, with PGR management, sometimes we see a yield response, sometimes we don't see a yield response. Uh, there's just not a whole lot going on here is what it comes down to, all right? If we were to really look this over, there's just not a whole lot in terms of lint yield, okay? I mean, if you had to pick a treatment, moderate looks fine, right? But there's a good bit of overlap here. But what does happen is we see significant drops in gen turnout. So remember with the nitrogen uh, application, we saw the same thing. So gen turnout, more aggressive PGR management leads to lower gen turnout, okay? Not necessarily lower yield, right? But lower gen turnout. So I want to talk about that as well, okay? So one other thing as it relates to biomass, if you look here, if you did nothing, if you did apply no PGRs, right? As we increase nitrogen rate, it really has no positive effect on reproductive biomass, right? So if you don't control growth, you don't see the benefits of the higher, higher nitrogen application rate in terms of reproductive biomass. But as we control growth, basically as we increase nitrogen application rate, we get higher reproductive biomass, okay? That's what this graph is showing, okay? Um, in uptake and nitrogen use efficiency, this is a pretty short story here. There was no <coughs> effect of PGR management on nitrogen uptake and nitrogen use efficiency. So what I would like to do is just kind of provide some quick overview, some quick conclusions here. Um, and that is that and then if you looked at the nutrient uptake values, okay, so 120 pounds per acre and 180 pounds per acre application produced the same yields, right? Those same, those treatments though took up 190 pounds of nitrogen per acre, okay? So it means that those, that, those plants were using the nitrogen we put out and then they were pulling additional nitrogen from the soil, right? Um, if we look at this, and this is something I want to spend a little bit of time on. Gen turnout dropped off as we increased nitrogen rate. Nitrogen use efficiency was unaffected. Okay, gen turnout declined as we increased nitrogen. I want to take this back to the physiology of crop. Why? I would, any, any participation here will be appreciated. If not, I have to answer my own questions, right? So, um, why would we see this gen turnout drop off in cotton as we increase nitrogen application rate? Any ideas? Seed. Someone who hasn't already seen this talk, what? I thought I heard someone Seed. say. Seed, right? Absolutely. So this cotton crop, so think about it. You know, we, we increase nitrogen. We went from 120 to 180. We aren't, we're not seeing that yield bump, right? And this is the challenge. So you know, we'd love it if, you know, we, if we put out more, we get more in return, right? But the plant's basically fighting against you. So you, you increase that application rate, and what does the plant do? The plant just produces more seed. There's more nitrogen. What is the main nitrogen sink in a cotton plant? Where's most of that nitrogen going? It goes to seed, okay? So if you up that nitrogen rate, what's the plant doing? The plant is just producing more seed. It's actually a higher number of seed per bowl. We didn't get into all of that. I don't know that we had time to get into that today. Um, but the plant's just producing more seed per bowl, okay? So your yield's not changing necessarily as you go from 120 to 180, but the plant is just basically using that nitrogen to make more seed, okay? That's what it's doing, okay? Um, if we look at uh, nitrogen use efficiency, again, that's pretty stable across treatments. Why? Because the increase in link yield you get is you know, you've also got an increase in uptake, so the efficiency kind of stays the same. That's a nice thing if you want to make broad recommendations, which I'm not going to do until we have more data, but you know that's a, that's a positive thing, right? Irrigation treatment had no effect on lint yield or gen turnout. Uh, that's a pretty short story there, but let's come back to the irrigation side of this. Irrigated, the irrigated treatment had higher vegetative biomass and nitrogen uptake, but lower nitrogen use efficiency. What are the practical implications here? Any, anybody care to chime in? Any thoughts? So the way I interpret this, okay, is how we manage irrigation, getting better at how we manage irrigation and only applying when the crop needs water, right, when it is absolutely necessary, also has the effect of making that plant more efficient at using nitrogen, right? So there's other benefits to 
to more efficiently managing water um, that are not just directly related to water itself, okay? <clears throat> All right, uh, methylpoc chloride effects on lint yield and gem turnout. So uh, I, I didn't really highlight this, but again, we saw, do you remember as we increased, we got more aggressive with, with picks, we saw that drop off in gem turnout. What do you think's going on there? Think back to the nitrogen thing, what's going on? Ah, silence. Okay. So you got a you got a smaller plant, right? It's got maybe it's got fewer bowls to distribute carbohydrate to, so it can put more into that bowl. But again, keep in mind, where's the plant? Sometimes put the extra that it has, right? It's going to put into more seed. Now, not only that, with with picks, it seems like the seed not seems like the seed actually get a good bit larger as well. Okay, with picks application, and we've seen that at multiple sites, uh, multiple projects over the past several years. That's, that's a very consistent response, that you have larger seed as you uh, get more aggressive with the picks manager. Now, that may not be relevant necessarily to the grower, but when you think about the seed that the grower plants and how the seed producers manage, you know, manage their crop can have a pretty substantial impact on the seed that's planted by everybody else. I mean, I think that's at least some important information pretty broadly. Um, again, uptake and nitrogen use efficiency weren't affected. Uh, and then what the last thing, of course, is that you know the positive effects of increasing nitrogen application rate on you know on reproductive biomass, you're only going to see those if you control growth. Okay? So with that, I'd like to thank the Cotton Physiology Lab, all the different members of my lab that are here today, some of them in the room right now. Uh, uh, collaborate pretty pretty regularly with the UGA Cotton Extension team, and with that, uh, I just open it up for any questions that uh, you may have. On the I've stayed within my time. Uh, so. on, on the end study, you had you had that 120 and the 180 rate, right? Yeah. And then yeah. you said made a statement later that they took up 190. They total. took up 190. So yes. the 120. Well, both of them, right? That's what I said. So the 120 gained 70 out of, out of the soil, and the Absolutely. 180 only gained 10. That's the only place so it's coming from, right? Is, yep. Isn't the irrigated because the irrigated well the 120 rate, excuse me. So how did how did how do you account for that 70 pound spread of uptake in the I mean I mean how why was that more fit to me that's more efficient. Mm -hmm. Well, if you I, look at the biomass, though, the biomass in those two treatments, the total biomass was the same. The plant just put more of it into sink. Okay. Um, I don't exactly know, you know, as far as accounting for that, it's pulling that obviously from the soil, right? We know that that's the difference, because I didn't put that out there, yeah. right? Um, but you're saying between the two upper end treatments, yeah, well, why what, is the what, uptake different? Why, why was the uptake yeah. different? I mean, one picked up a 70 pound gain. Sure. Well, if there's no difference in biomass, I wouldn't expect the uptake to be any different. So that's, that's where I'm... So they capped out, so they, they capped, capped out. out. They both right? capped that's out. That's as much as that, let's say that's kind of your carrying capacity of that field. 